chapter 2. Very familiar passage of scripture and a very familiar verse that we'll be reading. Even though we're going to start in verse 14, you probably know what verse 15 is. I'll explain what we're going to study after we do a scripture reading. I'm going to read a portion and drop down and read a, the, the end of the chapter as well. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and uh, verse 14 says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now everything we're going to read here has to do with words that don't have profit, and some people being subverted by false teaching. So it says, continuing, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already and have over, and overthrown the faith of some. Now drop down to verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do pray that these, this warning of this passage of Scripture might be clear in our mind, the simplicity of what it says might be understood as well, and that we might just reflect upon the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We concluded our study on the, on the threes in the book of Acts, but basically what that was is a, is a real study about right division, showing that God turned from Israel, turned to the Gentiles, and that's basically what right division is. And here, you're probably at this church because you know something about rightly dividing and that you understand its importance. My message today is, why is right division important? And uh, so it might be something that you already know, and, and it's really something, you know, you can make a whole big series. I got like seven points, but I want to make them kind of quick, and I'm going to make them all in one message. It, it's just something to reflect on, because uh, during the time we were doing the Acts, and we were talking about right division, there were more than two here at the church who had expressed something that, that has happened to me time and time again. And that is, you show someone very clear verses about right division, the truth of rightly dividing. And when you're all done, they say, well, why is that important? And you're kind of stunned because uh, you think, well, you know, it sure meant a lot to me. Well, I, <laughs> uh, and, and you've got to try to think of why it's important and throw those things out. And, and I'm going to give you seven thoughts, and they're, they, they're, they could be even more than this. Um, but it, even the taping we had this, this, this week with Pastor Jordan, there were two fellows that came down from Flint. They go to the Grace Bible Church up in Flint uh, under the ministry of Al Farver, and uh, they were waiting for the opportunity to come. And, boy, th these guys, you talk about energetic. I mean, they just a ball of fire. They, and one of the things is they couldn't wait to meet Pastor Jordan in person, but also to express to him how they came into the right division and how important it is to them and found out their father was a Baptist minister. And he had passed away. And they're saying, oh, if our dad was only alive, surely he would see this. And they were just, you know, thinking that if all oh, how much their dad would appreciate learning because what they have learned, they started getting, catching on to it from Les Feldick's TV ministry, came across Forgotten Truths TV ministry. I think they even wrote Berean Bible Society and got some literature. But they're just all excited about right division. And, uh, and yet you can run into some people that you show them right division and pff, there's nothing. And, uh, and when they ask, you know, why is right division important? Well, uh, we need to have an answer to that. And, and I just thought, well, you know, th that does come up and I've seen it come up. And I thought, well, we're going to deal with that today and just a nice simple message for us to think about. In this passage, as much as I would want to go verse by verse through this passage, 
You have rightly dividing the word of truth in verse 15, but the context all around it, above it, and then even at the end of the chapter there, is, is people that have been diverted from the truth, words that didn't profit, vain babblings, uh, and then words that eat like a canker. And then when you get down to verse 23, when it talks about avoid those questions that gender strife, people questioning things just to cause conflict, not to edify, just the question to cause confusion. And then the warning there in verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not, be, uh, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. <laughs> because when, when people aren't in the truth, you, you, they, can't, they don't always change their mind right away. So it goes on, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. When someone is not in the truth, they are actually working against themselves. The truth may, uh, makes you free. So if you're not in the truth, you're enslaving yourself by refusing to believe the truth. So in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now notice, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Well, we just got to wait for God all of a sudden to give them a thought. And now they can finally see the truth? Well, the way God would give them repentance, a change, repentance is a change of mind. The way God would do that is you doing what verse 24 and 25 said. You being instructing, being patient, teaching them, and that's the way God's going to use you to get the truth to them. And when they acknowledge the truth, you know, God working through you brings them to the acknowledging of the truth, then verse 26 happens that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. If it's not a truth, it's a lie. And the lie is the snare of the devil. And he's got many people snared in false doctrine. And the only way they're going to get out of that snare, they can recover themselves when they repent and believe the truth, you step out of the snare of the devil. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Anytime you refuse to believe the truth, you are at the mercy of Satan, and he has none. He'll take anybody captive. The only way to be saved from that error, uh, from, from the snare of the devil, is to believe the truth. And that takes us all the way back up to verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The way that you're a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, the way that you can be approved of God is when you study, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. So we could actually have another lengthy study. What do we mean, rightly dividing the word of truth? Well, let me say it several different ways. I'm not even going to take you to Bible verses. I just want you to understand this. That when the Bible's talking about rightly dividing the word of truth, we're talking about making a distinction between Israel and the body of Christ. Understanding that that today we're not Israel, we are the body of Christ, a new agency that God is working with. In the body of Christ, there's neither Jew or Gentile. We're all one in Christ, and we're called the body of Christ. To, to rightly divide, right division, has to do with making a distinction between not just law and grace. A lot of people are doing that. But to make a distinction between law, grace, and the new covenant. Because some people think grace is the new covenant, and then end up, taken the new covenants made with Israel, so now you're losing all the distinction again. You need to make a distinction between law, grace, and the new covenant. If you realize what I just did, that's past, present, and future. And right division is making, is actually making a timeline of the Bible. There's nothing wrong with that. That's when you see the illustration here of these two men who taught that the resurrection has... Uh, Concerning, uh, verse 18, concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. <laughs> they put the resurrection, our resurrection, in the wrong place. And, and you know, that's a big deal when you talk about the rapture, but they're, they're saying it already happened. There's men that already declare that the book of Revelation was fulfilled back when God dispersed Israel in 70 A.D., which probably took place more like 100 A.D., but... But anyhow, they're thinking, you know, the preterist doctrine that God already fulfilled everything and we're actually in the kingdom today and all kinds of that teaching. But that's, if you don't lay the timeline of the Bible out correctly, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. You're wrongly dividing the word of truth. So it's making those distinctions. Distinctions between God's purpose, promise, and eternal, eternal plan for the nation of Israel from the God's purpose, and promises an eternal plan for the body of Christ. They're not the same. 
God has a purpose for Israel and a purpose for the body of Christ. And it goes on not just in the present, but in eternity. God has an eternal purpose for both. And we need to make those distinctions. So dividing, when we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth, one interesting thought about that, sometimes you think you're dividing truth and error. No, you're dividing Israel's truth from the body of Christ's truth. And, and therefore, understand what the truth is for you as a member of the body of Christ. Uh, it's following, for us, it's following the doctrine, the, the, the body of truth given to the Apostle Paul for the body of Christ, and not following the body of truth that was given to the twelve apostles for the nation of Israel. It, it, and when I say follow, you can study it, learn it, but it's not... It's not given to you to practice or to be those, those promises are not given to you. So when we say right division, it's making that division. Now, when we talk then about what is the importance of right division, the very first number one reason is very obvious right there in front of us. The word truth is found in verse 15 and then there's some people who have uh, departed from the truth and then when you know the truth, you save yourself out of the snare of the devil. The number one reason that white division is important, someone says, well, why is that important? Because it's the truth. Now, you know, when you say that, I understand when you say the truth, you know, sometimes I get a little frustrated because there are people and in some maybe there, there are some doctrines, some teachings that are out there that I haven't given as much thought as I want people to give toward right division. For instance, uh, there, there's people out there that you know declare that the Earth is flat, that the Sun, the Earth does not rotate around the Sun, that the Sun rotates around the Earth. And I've listened to them, and I, and you know, if they hear this, they're really gonna get mad at me because <laughs> I listen to that, and and they use some Bible verses, but yeah, the whole introduction to their teaching is people don't care about the truth. They only care about what they've been taught. They follow the world philosophy. They taught what what they learned in school. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's me. <laughs> uh, there's other reasons that I don't believe it. Uh, but anyhow, I, I just bring that up to you to point the finger back at me before I start pointing it out to those that reject right division. But when we talk about right division here, rightly dividing, as I would explained it just in defining it, that that's the number one reason for it is because it's the truth. And the air, you can see the danger in the air. And, uh, and so truth is important. But you know, when you talk about the truth, that's why you realize, why do some people say, well, why is it important? Well, the truth of the matter is, some people don't care what the truth is. You know, it, it's one thing, there's some people who don't care what salvation is. You can explain the gospel that the truth is, you believe on Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, paid for your sins, rose from the dead to be your savior. When you trust what he did, God will give you the gift of eternal life. And if not, you're going to hell. And I don't care. I don't believe it's true. I don't know what the truth is. I'm not about to look into it. So some go through life, and we were just reading the verse in Thessalonians, that God's going to send strong delusions that they might believe a lie, who love not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Some people don't know, won't even know what the truth of the gospel is. But you know, when some people get saved, they say, Whew, glad I'm saved. Then when it comes to Bible study, oh, I don't care what truth is. <laughs> I just want to go fellowship with the saints, sing a nice nice hymns or something, and, and go home on Sunday. And, they, and they, they, their own personal pursuit of the truth is not there. And you understand that that happens to different degrees. And in some sense, you almost have to say it's okay in, in the sense that grace allows them to have that and, and to be patient until they realize that, you know, it's not okay not to know the truth. <laughs> it, it, but what I meant by okay, it's okay they're like that that's the job of ministry to bring them past that. And hopefully if they come to church, they'll be challenged to do a little bit more Bible reading, more personal Bible study. But when you ask the question, why do some not care? Well, some believers don't care because they don't really care a lot about the church. They're just kind of followers. Or some of them have been taught that you really can't know the Bible for certain. You might know you can be saved, but the rest of the Bible is kind of just jumbled up and it's only the experts can really tell you what it says and so you're just going to follow them because you've been taught you can't understand the Bible for yourself. And a lot of people are under that delusion. And then there's the also the other part of that is what, when someone asks why is right, right division important, 
when it comes to the truth, their pride is more important to them than the truth is. And that's what you're dealing with here about recovering from the snare of the devil. If God would give them the repentance. People don't want to, you know, some have studied for a lot of years. Maybe some a few. Some they're just attached to their church and they don't want to believe something different than what they've been taught for many years, what they believe for many years, what their churches uh, that they go to believe. And out of their pride, they refuse to receive the message. And one way to reject the message is say, why is that important? When you're talking about the word of truth. So you understand why it is that some come to those kind of statements. And uh, one of the reasons that it's true is the truth certainly makes you free. But one of the most important things about right division and, and the truth of right division, look at Romans chapter 3. Now we're dealing with the same subject in our Sunday school in Romans chapter 9. He first introduced it in chapter 3, that is the Apostle Paul. He's, he's already condemned both Jew and Gentile under sin. He's getting to that conclusion. Uh, but he had just condemned the Jews. Said their, their uh, circumcision has become uncircumcision. They became like a Gentile. And then he's going to deal in detail about God changing the program of dealing with Israel in Romans 9, 10, and 11. But he first said this in Romans chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? Much, every way. Chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. God's word, his, what God had said, has been committed to them and became written scripture. He says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith, the faith of God without effect? See, he's already condemned the Jews that they were in unbelief. So God, they had all these advantages. They had the word of God, and now they didn't believe. Does that make God's word ineffective? That you can't trust God's word? That the faith of God, the faithfulness of God is without effect? You can't trust God to do what he said? Look what he says in verse 4. God forbid. Yea, let God be true, and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mayest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. See, when some people think, well, God's done with Israel, he kind of changed the program, and now God's dealing with everybody in the world, and Whatever he was doing in the Old Testament, that's done. God's not really going to fulfill his promises to Abraham and David. He's not really going to set a kingdom up here on earth. Don't know what to do with the dispensation of grace, so they just blend Israel, now we're Israel, and they just camouflage God's word as if God didn't mean exactly what he said. And why that's important is you, you, you cast doubt, well, actually you, you talk against the integrity of God. If you say God is not going to keep his word, you're speaking against God. Right division is important for the very integrity of God. That God meant what he said, his promises are true, and they will happen in the order that he said they were going to happen. And right division is important for the integrity of God himself. And, you know, if we just stop there, that's good enough. So that, I just warn you this, I warned a young man about this Wednesday, that those who... When they, rightly, or when they don't rightly divide their Bible, when they make the body of Christ and Israel the same thing, when they make the kingdom on earth and the kingdom in heaven the same thing, when they don't distinguish between what God promised Israel and God promised us, they, they actually just spiritualize the Bible. And there's a saying that's really important. Those who spiritualize tell spiritual lies. Because that's exactly what they do. That they're spiritualizing, well, God said this, but that really don't mean that. And then they tell you what they think it means, and now they're lying to you. Because God meant what he said. That's what this passed. Let God be true and every man a liar. So the number one reason someone asks you why right division is important is because it's the truth. It's God's truth, and you calling God a liar if you don't rightly divide. Well, there's one point. <laughs> The second reason right division is important is the clarity of the gospel. What could be more important than Jesus Christ coming into this world to die on the cross to pay for all of mankind's sin 
and God to offer the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God's gift that's being offered to this world is eternal life through what Jesus Christ accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. You're in Romans, Romans 3 here. Just look down in verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But previously it talked about us receiving righteousness and the, way, the means by which we can be righteous before God. Verse 24 says, Being justified freely by His, that's God's grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to explain, I'm jumping down to verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by, the, uh, justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing there is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Salvation is God's gift on the basis of faith today. If you don't rightly divide the Bible, you can't know for sure how to be saved because in those gospel accounts of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, you're going to, re you're going to hear verses, read verses that say, repent and be baptized. You're going to read verses that talk about taking up your cross and following him and that if you don't hate father and mother, you're not worthy to be Jesus' disciple and that you must endure to the end to be saved and therefore you need to not just trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have to make him Lord of your life. You've got to be willing to die. And if, you're not Lord of, if he's not Lord of your life, he's not Lord at all and you're not saved. And if you read those gospel accounts, all that is true of what's written in the gospel accounts that are going to be true in the tribulation age. But all that before the preaching of the cross ever came about. It's the Apostle Paul who comes and starts explaining the cross of Christ and begins to talk about salvation, as it says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In fact, it's the Apostle Paul who would say in Romans chapter 4 and verse 4, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But, him that, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Verse, chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when, when we talk about a matter of faith, in verse chapter 4, in verse uh, 22, it says, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. It was imputed to Abraham. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it, righteousness, shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. Just reading these verses, they're so clear to me that a person's not saved by the basis of their works. They're saved on the basis of the cross work of Christ and the complete payment he made on the cross and that we can be found righteous if we'll quit trying to save ourselves and trust Jesus Christ to be the Savior that God sent him to be and the work that he accomplished is sufficient. Trust that. And when you trust that, God saves you and gives you everlasting life. That's, that's different than what you're reading in the gospel accounts when it was before the preaching of the cross. And another important thing, a lot of times people, especially even this time of year, uh, We'll quote verses about believing in Jesus. There's a difference in Paul's, from Paul's epistles from believing that Jesus is the Christ to believing in the cross work of Jesus Christ. Paul in 1 Corinthians, just flip over, that's the next book. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 17. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Seems like baptism gets in the way of the gospel, doesn't it? For the preaching of the cross is to them which, which, peri which, to them which perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. Verse 21, it says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching, according to verse 18, is preaching the cross. He says in chapter 2 that he preached Christ and him crucified. My point is, when you read the book of John, you know what you're reading about believing in Jesus? John says, These things I write unto you that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
That's what the Jews needed to believe, that their Messiah, Christ, was Jesus. John wrote the book so that they might believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's not the gospel message today. There's all kinds of people who can believe Jesus is the Christ and still go to hell. The gospel message today is now after the cross. Paul preaches the cross being the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. Our belief is in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul delivered how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that if you believe that, you're saved. So Paul didn't just preach Jesus is the Christ. That's a beginning point. But he preached Christ and him crucified. So if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you're never going to get the gospel clear. And you could be calling yourself a Christian and not even be saved because you're not believing in the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel, the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ that saves today. In fact, that verse in Thessalonians, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that have died in Jesus will God bring with him. When we talk about the rapture, the rapture, those who are going to get raptured start out with those who believe in Christ who died and rose again. And it's not just that he did those events, it's what he accomplished in that death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, but it's not just who he is, my, that's my point. So the second reason that the right division is important, or the third reason right division is important, is, is to know what God is doing today. I have you over here in Corinthians, and uh, go over with me to chapter 12. Now, if you want to know what God is doing today, read Romans to Philemon. So you realize I'm not going to give you everything that God is doing today. But I want to show, point out a verse here. And it's interesting where this is found, in fact. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul's going to write to them, the Corinthians, because of, of their misunderstanding of spiritual gifts. What the Holy Spirit is doing in people today. Boy, that's, there's a difference when I say the difference between what God's doing today and the New Covenant. There's a difference between the Holy Spirit working in the New Covenant and the Holy Spirit working in the Day of Grace. But uh, again, that'll take a, another study. I, what I point out to you is verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And all I want to say to you is that you won't know how the Holy Spirit of God is working today unless you rightly divide the word of truth. Next, there are differences of administration but the same Lord. Jesus Christ is administrating the dispensation of grace today. And that tells you there are different administrations. He had an administration to the nation of Israel. That's why Jim pointed out to you before he sang, is Israel relates to him as king. If we're the body of Christ, now he is going to be king eternal, so he's going to reign over heaven and earth. The kingdom of God is all going to be put in the hands of Jesus Christ. So you can call him king, but the way you relate to Jesus Christ today, when you read Ephesians and Colossians, he's the head of the body. So that there's different administrations, but the same Lord. If you're going to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to know what administration he's ministering today. Which one you're under. And then verse 6 says, There are diversities of operations, but the same God which worketh all and in all. Diversities of operation. That is, God is working different ways at different times. And you've got to know how he's working today. If there's different operations of God, if he worked differently in time, you need to know how he's working today. And that's the third point. The right division is important to know what God is doing today. The, now, now, this kind of ties into that, but just a little bit further than that. You need to know how to rightly divide to know who we are. Who you are. And I've said that in the very introduction to here. What is right division? It's making the distinction between the nation of Israel and the body of Christ. <laughs> and who you are is you are a member of the body of Christ. Look at chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Make it nice and easy for you here. In fact, when we talk about the body of Christ, boy, that, first of all, let me say this to you. The body of Christ is only found in Paul's epistles. Now, anybody doing any Bible searching and come across that term, go, wow, how come Peter never called the body of Christ? You know what? Everybody wants to take the church, the body of Christ, and refer to Peter, where Peter says, you're a royal priesthood. How many of you heard people say that now that you're a believer, you're, 
you're, you're part of the priesthood of God. You know, I still read there's a one, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. A priest is someone who's a mediator. But the nation of Israel, God called them to be a nation of priests because they are going to take the message to the Gentiles and be the go-between between between a holy God and sinful Gentiles. God's going to use the nation of Israel to bring the Gentiles to God. We today, Paul calls us ambassadors, sent from heaven with a message from God, but he don't call us priests. And we're not a priesthood and we're not a holy nation. That's Peter's terms to the nation of Israel. Paul says over more than 20 times in his epistles, he refers to us as the body of Christ. And he's the only one who mentions the body of Christ. You think that might be important and distinct? And if you've got to know who you are, are you a priest? Are you the nation of Israel? Are you the body of Christ? And people say, that oh, don't make any difference. Yeah, it does make a difference. God's purpose involved in each one of those, but then we'll get to that point. The fo- my point is, is to know who you are. You are a member of the body of Christ. Chapter 10, verse 16, when we took communion, this is an important passage. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. We are one body. That, that importance to understand that who you are, that you're a member of the body of Christ. That verse in Colossians says, and be ye thankful. <laughs> know who you are and be thankful for who you are. When you want to be the nation of Israel, you're not thankful for who you are. Plus you're living a lie, you're not Israel. And you're professing a lie when you say that to others. You're you're a member of the body of Christ. Chapter 10, verse 32. It says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So the church of God is God's called out assembly. Well, we are the called out assembly that's... Ephesians says it this way, The church which is his body. Because God called out of Israel a group of people, but they're a kingdom people. They're a holy nation. But we're the church which is his body, and so in this age of grace, there's only there's three people, three groups that you're not to give offense to. Jews, that's lost Jews. Gentiles, that's lost Gentiles. The body of Christ, that's everybody who's saved. The church of God is called here, but that's a reference to us today, the body of Christ. Now come over to chapter 12. Jump right to verse 27. Just in case you don't know who you are, it says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. So, and, and notice the phrase, now. Meaning that's not what people were before, but now you are the body of Christ. So, it's important to know who you are. Now, there's a whole bunch of information that God has for the body of Christ, but you're not going to appreciate that information until you first know who you are. And therefore, you're actually realizing who you're not. And that's what we call right division. Uh, So that was point number four. Point number five is right division is important for knowing how and when we became a member of the body of Christ. This is where a lot of the rub comes in. How and when. Well, let's first deal with how since we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So how did we become a member of the body of Christ? Well, at a certain point in time, God the Holy Spirit took all believers and baptized and placed them into the body of Christ. That's how you became a member of the body of Christ. You didn't become a member of the body of Christ by being water baptized. You didn't become a member of the body of Christ by joining a church. You didn't become a member of the body of Christ by walking an aisle and all the other things that you know, people identify with. You become a member of the body of Christ that when you became a believer, God the Holy Spirit placed you in the body of Christ. And, and so that's how you became that. When you became that... Boy, there's one main passage. Hold your place here. 1 Timothy chapter 1. When we were talking about the Acts, people argue in the book of Acts is different places where they think the body of Christ began. 
But here's a verse of scripture that you can go to to say, well, when did the body of Christ begin? Verse 15, just to save some time here. It says in verse 15, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now that long suffering has to do with God setting aside the nation of Israel and rather bringing a quick end to the world. Like when you read the book of Revelation, it's going, the world's going to come to an end real fast. Seven years, boom, it's over. But God today is long suffering because he has postponed his dealings with Israel, his promises, his fulfillment. He has postponed his wrath, wanting people to be saved and extended a period that's called the long suffering of God and he began it with Paul. When God saved the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus and met the, the Lord on the road to Damascus, God began something new that with, started with Paul. So, how did you become a member of the body of Christ? Is when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit put you in the body of Christ. When did that happen? When God saved Saul and sent him out to the Gentiles. And, and that's... That's the whole ministry. Another verse. Now this one. If you can't quote Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses at least 1 through 5, <laughs> you ought to do that. But look at that passage, because we refer to it quite often, because there are those who actually, when we talk about right division, you'll notice we start talking about dispensations. And some people say, I don't believe in dispensational truth. I don't believe in dispensations. Well, one of the reasons they might not is they might have a Bible that don't have that in there. If you have a King James Bible, you have it in there a few times. And you have it in there defining different time periods as well so that there's more than one dispensation. But, you know, when we talk about administration, when you talk about uh, uh, economy, th those kind of things, so those are terms that is what a dispensation is. Dispensation means to dispense. Ephesians chapter 3. We just saw that God began to do something with Paul. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostle, apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, God's bringing Jew and Gentile, and they're sharing an inheritance, and of the same body, all who believe are baptized into one body today, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. God used Paul to turn to the Gentiles when he did. It's called the dispensation of the grace of God. Now people say, I don't believe in dispensational truth. Well, you don't believe in Ephesians 3. Why is it important? Well, God turned to you with a message of His grace that He's dispensing to you. So, right division is important because that's how you know how and when you became part of the body of Christ. It's through that ministry of the Apostle Paul in that phrase, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge. It's in Paul's epistles that you find out what God's message is for the body of Christ. And uh, you want to know God's word for you? You've got to know what right division is and where to find your writing, where, where to find God's word to you. Even in, in what we're talking about here, the sixth reason for the importance of right division is to know our purpose and destiny. If God had a purpose that's an eternal purpose for the nation of Israel that he'll fulfill in the future, and God's got a different purpose and destiny for the body of Christ, then, then you want to know what God's purpose for you is. He saved you, and he has a purpose in saving you. And, and that purpose has to do with where he is going to place you. We, we could quote 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, talks about the rapture, how the Lord's going to come, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we that are alive and remain are going to be caught up in the air 
to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up is the rapture. Everybody else in your Bible is not waiting to be caught up. Everybody else in your Bible is waiting for Christ to come down. Now he is going to descend, but he's going to descend in heaven. I heard a preacher one time preach that the air just means anything like six feet off the ground. So just being resurrected, you're in the air. Doesn't that phrase that say to meet, I'm going to quote it wrong, the word clouds are in there. <laughs> so it's either the rapture is going to take place on a very cloudy day, so that six foot there's a cloud, or you're going to actually be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. All of a sudden I can't get to quote the verse. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall uh, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. There we go. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. My point is, our de we're going to be, are we waiting for the Lord to come? Thy kingdom come in earth? Or are we really going into heaven? And you read Ephesians, you find out there were, we've been made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ that in the ages to come. You read in, First Thessal in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 5 that if this earthly house of this tabernacle, this body we're walking in, were to dissolve, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Some people can't figure out if we're coming or going, and some people got the idea that we're gone, but we're coming back. But if it's eternal in the heavens, and that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, that in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his glory and his grace and his kindness toward us, then, then we're not coming back. The purpose of Israel is going to be fulfilled in the earth. But the point is, you learn your purpose and your destiny. When you talk about purpose, you're in Ephesians, aren't you? Look, look Keep Ephesians 3 there, and it says, uh, verse 8, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent, that now unto the principalities and powers uh, in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everything God does is not just a temporary time. We might live in the dispensation of grace, but God has an eternal purpose for us. Right now we're making known to the angels things that they never knew about God's grace. And God has an eternal purpose for us in those heavenly places. And all you got to do is read your Bible and find out, find out there's going to be some fallen angels, some angels that followed Satan, and Satan himself are going to get kicked out of heaven, and we have places to be in heaven. So you learn those things, and you, couldn't, you can never learn that truth if you don't rightly divide the word of truth. And the seventh reason for rightly dividing the word of truth is to know what on earth is God doing. You know, we talk about the operation of God, it kind of ties into that, but here we are on earth, so what on earth is God doing today? And you know, you got people doing faith healings and all kinds of other things. Is God really doing that today? If it's called the time of long suffering, is that what God is doing? Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become no, new, and all things are of God. Here's what God's doing. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. If you're a believer, by the way, I just ordained you. The Bible just ordained you. <laughs> I didn't. You're in the ministry. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? Well, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 
not imputing their trespasses unto them, but hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You got a message for this world that God's not holding their sins against them right now. And they have an opportunity to be reconciled to God. That God was in Christ, and in Christ He has provided the means for you to be reconciled to Him. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's the message we need to tell people. And explain this way, for He, God, hath made Him, Christ, to be sin for us who know no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. But that doesn't end there. Look, look at chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with Him, this is what God's doing, we're workers together with Him, beseech you that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For He has said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you're lost, today's the day of salvation, not later. And if you're a believer, don't receive the grace of God in vain. Understand what God is doing, what His message is to the world. Be a good ambassador and go out and tell people. And, and right division will tell you exactly what God is doing on earth today. Now there's more than what He's doing there. One of the things that He's doing is, look, look at chapter 4 and verse... Uh, Verse 11, For we which are alive are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Not only does he want you to be ambassador with the right message, but he wants to manifest the life of Jesus Christ in you. And that gets involved with how the Holy Spirit works, what the Word of God does effectually in us, all of that. You can't know how God is working in you, how God is working in the world. You won't know what God is doing in the earth today unless you learn to rightly divide the word of truth. And if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you'll never understand your Bible. You will, you will not be a very good ambassador since you're not going to represent the right message that God of heaven has given you. You will carry the wrong message to people. You will not manifest Christ in your life. You won't prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And you will be a workman who will need to be ashamed when it's all over because you're unapproved of God because you haven't rightly divided the word of truth. Now, what was that question we started with? Why is right division important? I think it's extremely important. And it's not really that hard to understand and do. You just need to be, believe it, get out of the snare of the devil, and then understand these things and, and be what God has called us to be in the age of grace as members of the body of Christ. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I do thank you for the ten of ears that are here. And Father, we're here because we did care when we heard a difference and did search the scriptures and saw these things were so. Lord, it's hard to, to get people to wake up because for so many reasons they... Don't, either don't care or they've been so deceived. Help us to be that servant that doesn't strive, but to be gentle and patient so that those who are in, in a snare can recover themselves as we just keep presenting the truth to them. Help us to be good ambassadors and to continue to rightly divide the word of truth. Thank you for our gathering and thank you for this uh, purpose you've given us in your grace and the fact that we collectively uh, make a stand as a local church. Uh, on these truths, and not just stand for it, but make it known to others as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom. It can't be any clearer than that, can it? Let's stand and sing a little chorus. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. You 
are dismissed.